everybody. Welcome. My name's Kate McIntosh. I uh, know most of you, I think. I'm Executive Director of the Promise Institute for Human Rights. Thank you for coming. Um, before I introduce the speaker today, I'd just like to remind you all that this evening at 6 o'clock, we are screening the film River of Gold about gold mining in Peru. Um, this is a co-sponsorship with Amazon Aid Foundation. It's meant to be a really fantastic film. It's narrated by Sissy Spacek. Uh, and it's about the horrendous consequences of gold mining in the Amazon jungle and what's being done about that. And um, that's at six o'clock tonight and it will be followed by a panel discussion with the filmmakers. So I hope you're able to join us for that. Okay, so today, welcome to the third in our Global Justice and Accountability Speaker Series. Um, we had US Ambassador Stephen Rapp, many of you were here for his talk, and former Nuremberg prosecutor, Mr. Ben Ferenz, and um, today I'm delighted to welcome Alan Werner, who's the founding director of the NGO Civitas Maxima, uh, independent legal representation of victims of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, you'll see on the sheet, the tables in front of you, that we have a few more speakers in this series, and I'd just like to say, and I checked with Alan if I could mention this without undermining him, in case anyone's worried that we have a series of male presenters, <laughs> we're hoping that Fatou Ben Souda from the ICC will be able to add her picture to that soon. So back to today. Uh, delighted to have Alain here. Alain is um, a lawyer registered with the Geneva Bar, and he has an LLM from Columbia University, so he knows about US law schools. He has a distinguished and varied career in international criminal justice. He worked for the Office of the Prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone on various trials, including the, prosecutor, uh, including the prosecution of Charles Taylor, the Liberian president. He worked in Cambodia on the first trial at the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, mm. representing the victims or the civil parties in that trial. Uh, he also represented victims against former president of Chad, Hissen Habre, in the prosecution in Senegal, in the extraordinary African chambers. And he's now involved, among other things, in representing the victims in the Liberian case being held in the courts in Switzerland against Alio Kozaya, another Liberian case. Um, Anna has a lot to tell us about, so I'll take up no more time. I just ask you to give him a round of applause and thank him for being here. All right, thank you very much. I'm very, very happy um, to be here today. Uh, I want to thank, obviously, the, the Promise Institute um, and the law school, Jessica, Jessica Peake, um, Kate, um, and then the people who organized it, uh, Sherry, um, Sherry Yuan, Caleb Kim. I'm very, very grateful um, for all of you to have me here. And I want to thank uh, Bonia Bonza. This is thanks to her that I was introduced uh, to the Promise Institute. You will understand by what I'm going to tell you today that um, the quest of justice, now it's a historical quest for justice, but it's still a quest for justice of the Armenian uh, community is very close um, to my heart. So um, for me, it's, um, for me, it's, um, good. For me, it's a privilege um, to be here today. So I was told that I can, I have so many things to tell you, but I was told that I could talk for 40, 45 minutes. I will do my very best. Um, and then we will, um, we will exchange because I have some, I think, exciting things to tell you. Um, and I would uh, very much uh, appreciate your feedback and for us to discuss. And I was given a very strict instruction to prioritize the questions of the students so don't mind uh, when there will be, if hopefully there will be questions, then uh, the students, I was told, will have um, the priority. So here is the deal to start with. As a lawyer, as Kate said, I have been basically involved in prosecution uh, for war crimes all my life. I don't know to do anything else than basically putting cases um, for war crimes. And for now, uh, 15 years, I have been obsessed and frankly sometimes I wonder if this is a blessing or this is a curse but this is a situation for me I have been obsessed with one question which is how to contribute somehow in our field in order for accountability to be more and more 
present. And there was a French biologist and philosopher that nobody knows about. His name is Jean Roston. And this guy had, at the time, this quote. He said, kill one man and you are a murderer. Kill millions of men and you are a conqueror. Kill them all, kill them all and you are a god. And then on, in our field, from human rights lawyer representing victims, and I don't really know who did it, who transformed this quote, but someone transformed this quote and basically we have this quote, which is, I think, coming from Jean Rostand, and which says, if you kill one person, you go to jail. If you can tell 10 people, then you go in an insane asylum. And if you kill 10,000 people, then you are invited to a peace conference. <laughs> and unfortunately, I think this is very true. And this is a situation today where statistically, if you kill in a war at a level of command or a level of political power 10,000 people, then I think statistically, very complicated word to pronounce for me, statistically, you, are more, you have more chances not to go to jail than to go to jail. And this for me is unbearable. But this is the system today. And my obsession has been how to find a way how to create systems which can, could basically change that exact thing. So let me first, before I tell you how I think we can do that, let me first tell you what is the situation today. And this is a paradox, but the situation is not completely bleak in the sense that many things have been done by many people over the past years. And my aim here is not to tell you, let's get rid of everything which has been done and start all over again. Obviously, that would be a, a moment of fundamental mistake. My aim here is to tell you, let's build up on everything which already exists and is working, but create a new way, a new system in order for accountability to step up and in order for at some point in the future, maybe when your great, great children, me, I won't be there anymore, but your great, great children will be there, then the guy who killed 10,000 people in the battlefield, then hopefully that guy will have more chance to be held accountable than not. So let's, let's quickly for me to tell you three things which are already happening, which are great news, and upon which we should build this system that I would like to propose to you, expose to you today. The first thing, and I'm very interested um, to talk with law professors here later today to understand what they think, but in Geneva, a very respected professor of international humani humanitarian law, so basically the Geneva Convention, the conduct of warfare, they teach today, they teach that the body of law, basically when you are in combat, the rules that you have to follow, the Geneva Convention, are more respected than violated. So in fact, more often than not, and this is a paradox with what I just told you, more often than not, in combat, people respect the Geneva Convention. And the ICRC, so the, the, the International Red Cross, headquartered in Geneva, which is visiting almost a million prisoners of war every year, so they know something about respect or non-respect of the Geneva Convention, they start now an online database on the ICRC website in order to show to people that indeed many, many, many times combatant commanders respect, do respect the Geneva Convention. And this is important because in a way, if you have a law, the Geneva Convention, and nobody respects it, and we just commit war crimes all the time, why do we even talk about that body of law if there is no respect for it? But it looks like indeed more often than not there is respect. And here is the very interesting thing, is that possibly, at least this is, I think, my case or the case of many of us, we have the impression when you read newspaper, you go to internet, you have the impression that there are war crimes committed absolutely all the time, uh, which is true as well. And the paradox here, of course, is that today we know about that. 
Because today, and for many years, and this is the second thing which is fantastic, for 30 or 40 years, you have great organizations starting in the 1970s, like Human Rights Watch, like Amnesty International, and others, who are telling us about the violation. So when violation happened, and we know about that, and before, of course, some centuries ago, we didn't know. A commander could kill 10,000 people, and nobody would know about that, but today we know. And of course, now, for a few years, um, with, with, with the cell phones, with internet, victims groups as well are basically mobilizing, and every time there are violations, groups do not wait for Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International to put press release and to put reports. Themselves, they are going on Twitter, they are going on social media, and they are communicating. So there is a body of law which more often than not is respected, and when it's not, when there are international crimes, then we know about it. So these are the first two good news. And the third good news is that now, since um, 1990, and Kate was one of the very first to work then in The Hague, there was a new body of law with international courts, starting with um, uh, ICTY, of course, and then ICTR, and then since 2002, uh, the International Criminal Court. Roughly for 50 years, nothing happened, nothing happened after the World War II. Uh, after Nuremberg because of the Cold War, and then when the Cold War was over, then this tribunal started to exist with a very important jurisprudence and very important cases. So you are going to tell me, but then what is the problem? We know about the crimes, there is a body of law that we, is respected more often than not, and then there are international tribunals. So why do we, why do we bother? Why are you so obsessed about creating new systems, and here is the bad news after three good news, but it's a very big bad news. The bad news is that obviously, if you put things into perspectives, and last night because I'm so jet lagged and I couldn't uh, sleep as you probably can feel, <laughs> then I went online to, do, to, to check a bit, and then since 1990 quickly, and this is not exhaustive, but just to give a feel, a sense, put things in perspective, so since 1990, since these, since these uh, interna international tribunals started, we had the Yugoslav war, obviously. We have the war in Liberia. We have the war in Sierra Leone. We have the invasion of Kuwait. We have the civil war very bloody in Algeria. We have war in Chechnya, the second Congo war, which was an absolute massive bloodshed. And then, of course, the Iraqi war, the war in Darfur, the war in Sri Lanka. Um, the Syrian conflict, the Gaza war, and now the Rohingya. So this is just to give you, and of course, it's not because there is a war that war crimes have committed. Huh? It's not because you kill someone in combat. This is not a war crime. But we know by the NGOs that in every single of these wars that I told you about, there were very, very serious war crimes and crimes against humanity committed. So this is what happened since 1990. On the other side, which accountability did we get with the tribunals? And this is a fact from the um, ICTY, ICTR website. So ICTY, 89 people convicted. ICTR, 62 people convicted. ICC since 2002, uh, eight people convicted, two people acquitted. So about 160 conviction from the three, bless you, from the three main um, international tribunals. Of course, there are other, but there were less convictions. So about 160 with an, I cannot even, I mean, nobody, has a count on how many war crimes committed in all this war, but you have a sense that it's many, 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 and on the other side, the international tribunals. And again, of course, I'm the first proponent of international tribunals, and of course we should not get rid of international tribunals, but we should invent other systems to complement because this is not enough. I mean, it's clear for everybody, and I don't think nobody is disputing that. This is just not enough. So other things need to be invented. And here is another good news. Something already exists. There is something else, and this is how uh, we function and many other NGOs. There is not only the international tribunals that you can use, but there is the national court. Okay? You can go in front of a national court in order, as a victim of international crimes, to get redress for war crimes. And the very big event, incredible event, which happened at some point and sort of 
was, was such an important event and, and made us, all of us, human rights lawyers, international criminal lawyers, realize that indeed this is something we could use and we should use to get justice on behalf of the victims. And we just, I think last week, Wednesday, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of that event. And this is, of course, the arrest in London, 17 October 1998, the arrest of Augusto Pinochet, former president of Chile, who was visiting, always a controversy, whether he was there for medical reasons, or in fact, he was there for arm deals, whatever. He was visiting London, and guess what? He was arrested based on a European arrest warrant coming from Spain, requesting on behalf of victim the arrest of Augusto Pinochet following a 16, 16 month legal battle. Pinochet was in house arrest almost 500 days during that time. And frankly, nobody thought that something like this was indeed possible, but it was possible. And the world, or at least our, our field, knows very well about Baltazar Garçon, which was a judge who issued the arrest. But for me, of course, Baltazar Garçon is a hero. But for me, the very big hero is a lawyer who, behind the scene, was, was the one who filed the complaint, Juan Garces. And for me, Juan Garces is the definite hero of the Pinochet saga, because for years and years and years, quietly waiting, Juan Garces was documenting all the torture and all the crime committed by uh, Pinochet. And he waited the right time. And at the right time, he filed the right complaint. And then that got Pinochet arrested. And this was really an astonishing event on our side. And suddenly we realized that for the, victim war crime, for the, the victims of war crime we represent, it was not only going to international court, but we could use national court to get something like that. And in a way, and Kate mentioned it, the most beautiful legacy of the Pinochet case, so ultimately Pinochet, because politics in a way took over and won at the end, uh, we won on the legal ground. He was supposed to be sent to Spain, except that there was a conservat there was, there was, um, conservative government in Spain. It would have been a complete mess to have a trial of Pinochet in Spain. You think about that. Spain, we never had justice for the victims of Franco, and suddenly there could have been a public trial of Pinochet in Madrid. I mean, this would have been something quite extraordinary. So politics took over. Uh, over the law, and Jack Straw decided to uh, send uh, Pinochet because of medical reasons. And we all, or you may remember, this um, scene when Pinochet came back to Chile, and then he was supposed to be handicapped and cannot get out of the wheelchair. And as soon as he's in Chile, hop, out of the wheelchair, whatever. But the point is that this was, I think, very, very, very big on our side. And then uh, someone that I have a lot of respect uh, for him, he was my professor at Columbia uh, in 2002, um, an American lawyer called Ril Brody, working with Human Rights Watch, who was with Human Rights Watch involved in advocacy around the Pinochet case. So he was clever to think, OK, where is the next Pinochet? Now, where is the next Pinochet? Using exactly uh, that jurisprudence and using national laws. And this was a His and Abre case, incredible story of a dictator of Chad during 1980s who basically killed, I mean, historians disagree, but tens and tens of thousands of people. And then he was basically kicked out by the man who is still president of Chad, Idris Deby. He went to Dakar in Senegal, and he was fine. Why not? He was fine, because this was the way it was, it was happening. You had killed so many people, you go, to another place where you are friends with the head of state, you marry his daughter, or you do whatever, you give a little bit of money, and you're fine. This was the world before. So Reed, understanding Pinochet, started to think, wait a minute, we are going after Abre in court in Dakar, and then there was it was possible as well to go to Belgium, 
the, I would, could talk for hours about the, about the Habre case, but long story short, for 15 years, and this is a problem, is that this is outside the beaten track, this is outside politics. States did not want the Pinochet case, states did not, international community did not want the Habre case, so it's complicated, it's very complicated. So read Human Rights Watch with fantastic Chadian lawyers and as well Senegalese lawyers and some of us, we and read mainly the coalition managed to get finally after years and years and years and years of legal battle to get a trial of Issen Abre in Dakar, which is really something absolutely incredible to get, uh, to get him in Dakar. And I can tell you I was part of that adventure. This happened in 2016. Issen Abre was convicted on the 30th of May 2016, crimes against humanity, war crimes, torture, upheld in appeal in April 20. 17, this is extraordinary. This should never have happened. I mean, this was not the way politics work, and this is really the intervention of human rights lawyers with victims using the tools which are available and believing this is possible. So this is the legacy we have. We have this national court. Things are possible to do uh, in front of uh, those uh, national court, and now, this is part of the system, so the preamble of the International Criminal Court, uh, the Rome Statute, recognize that and said in the preamble, recalling that it is the duty of every state to exercise its criminal jurisdiction over those responsible for international crimes. In other words, the International Tribunal and the one, the permanent one, the ICC, is telling the states, we, ca we as International Court cannot do so much <laughs> because it costs so much money, it's complicated. So you states, you have to do the work. You have to try people for war crimes in your country. And when we say you have to try people for war crimes in your country, we are not only talking about, let's say, in the US, you have an American committing war crimes. Obviously, well, normally, or let's say, America maybe is a bad example. Let's say in Switzerland. <laughs> <coughs> in Switzerland, you have a guy who committed war crimes. Let's say, I hope that he will be tried in Switzerland because he's Swiss, okay? Same way if he commits war crimes in Switzerland, which look uh, unlikely, but he will be tried. But here I'm talking about what the laws allow us to do. In other words, if, if, I, uh, li if, let's say Liberia, because I will tell you about Liberia in a second, I got arrested in Switzerland, 60 kilometers from my hometown, Geneva. In Lausanne, we got arrested a Liberian guy who was alleged to have committed war crime in Liberia, against Liberian, in Liberia, is Liberian, nothing to do with Switzerland. Well, he was in Switzerland re residing for 15 years. This was Switzerland's duty to go after him. So this is now the architecture that we have, and which already, compared to 40 years ago, is a big progress. You have international court, and then you have national court, and this national court they have the duty to go after the people in their soil who have committed international crimes. That's what they are supposed to do. And then you have lots of NGOs which are doing a very good job in several countries to build cases so they know about someone somewhere and they get evidence and they bring to this war crime court. So in all these mainly European countries but elsewhere as well, you have what was created after the Rome Statute and the ICC War Crime Court, so specialized units, which are their only job is to build these cases. So NGOs, you have ECCHR in Berlin, trial in Switzerland, you have Redress in London, you have a great one in San Francisco, CJA, Center of Justice and Accountability, with whom uh, we partner on the case, great organization uh, working on civil case uh, here in the uh, US. So organization use this national court to bring these cases, and this is a very, very great progress, okay? Now, so this is what is going on today, okay? But as you understood by what I'm trying to tell you, I think this is still very unsatisfactory. And this is not going to get us to a stage where the guy who killed 10,000 people, the commander or the political guy, 
is going to be held accountable if we go that rate. And NGOs do report about telling you, telling everybody, how many cases they manage to bring to this war crimes unit. So again, last night, it's great when you don't sleep, you have lots of things to do. So I went to get uh, the, the figures, and then I saw that last year, there were cases brought in 14 countries, which is great. So mainly in Europe, but South America as well, and the US. And then there were about 126 people, very, very uh, different conflict, many, many different situations. So this is what the NGOs using the war crimes. And now in Europe, what is happening is that there are so many Syrian refugees that the country starts screening the Syrian refugees, and sometimes they start uh, this war crimes case when they think that someone has committed war crimes. So actually, this figure, 120, is 106% increase for the year before, and this is where we are. Well, remember the stats I gave you in international court, 200 or 300, and then you had 100, allez, 150 maybe. What do we have? 450? This is what the system is today. 400 people that are held accountable, international court, national court, war crimes unit, NGOs, whatever, 400. This is not satisfactory when you think of how many war crimes are committed, all the list of conflict I gave you, the Syrian conflict, everything else, and then you have three, 400 um, people held accountable. This is not, of course, this is not satisfactory. And this is the last time I tell you that, okay? But because I didn't sleep last night, <laughs> I went just to have a sense to the Los Angeles Superior Court website <laughs> just to try to understand. So Los Angeles is a city of 4 million people, you probably know. And interestingly enough, I thought that then Los Angeles would be in the top 50 most populated cities in the world. Well, it's not. And the first one most populated city in the world, I didn't even know the name of that city, believe it or not, in Chongping, in China, first most populated city in the world, 33 million people, I didn't know that city existed, now I know something else. So Los Angeles is a big city, but it's not even, as I told you, among the 50 biggest city in the world. Well, guess what? How many criminal cases last year in Los Angeles, four million people? How many criminal cases where went at different level, I'm sure there are many plea bargains, but whatever, how many criminal cases in Los Angeles last year? 200,000 last year for a city of 4 million people, which is not even among the 50 <laughs> biggest city in the world. 200,000 for one city of 4 million people in the world. This is how criminal justice works when you do this work for normal crimes. And here I'm telling you that for international crimes, the most, the most important crimes all over the world, the accountability today on our side is not even four or 500 cases. So obviously, this is not, this is not satisfactory. And again, understand me right, I'm not criticizing every single progress which has been made because every single progress was very difficult to achieve and has brought concrete justice for victims. So it's not a question of saying we should get rid of everything which has been done. It's a question of understanding how we can try to create systems and scale up some system in order for that guy who uh, killed 10,000 people to be held accountable. For me, I have one, and of course I'm, I was not involved uh, with any of that, unfortunately, but I have one example, which is something I always thought that I should try somehow to recreate, and from that we could get a systemic something that we could scale up in order to maybe one day change that around and address seriously accountability. And this is what the Jewish people did after World War II. And I told you it was last time. One more time, because I didn't sleep last night, <laughs> I went to the Simon Wiesenthal Center website, and this I found something extraordinary that I have no idea. So basically, after World War II, the Jewish community got organized and started to track down alleged Nazis war criminals all over the world, okay? This was after the Nuremberg trial, after basically 1945. 
And on the Simontal website last night, I saw that from January 2001 to March 2006, so 50 years plus later, there has been, from those five years, January 2001 to March 2006, there has been 48, believe it or not, 48 convictions of Nazis. I don't know how old they were, probably over 80 or 90 years old. 48 convictions of Nazis were criminal obtained all over the world. 28 in the United States, 10 in Italy, three in Germany, three in Canada, one in Poland, two in Lithuania. This is extraordinary from 2001 to 2006. And you may have heard this year on the news in August 2018. Now we are what? 70 years later? 60, 70 years later? August 2018. A guy from living in Queens, New York. His name is Jackin Palich. 95 years old, suspected of crimes committed in Poland during World War II. And the guy had lied to immigration because he didn't say that he was part of the SS. And he was, they managed to prove that he was part of the SS. He was put in a plane and deported to Germany at 95 years old. The reason why I'm telling you that is that there needs to be, and this is where I'm coming, there needs to be quest for justice with intensity. So there need to be effort driven by people who know what they are doing, well-funded, outside politics, but doing it in a systematic way over and over and over the years. And this is the Jewish community who did it and they get results which are almost comparable to the, what the entire world is doing for all the crimes. They just do it 60 years later, still tracking down the Nazi still living. And again, I told you that me, I was not uh, part, of, uh, part of that effort, but I was part of an effort where war was a bit, I mean, a conflict which some similarity and Kate mention it, and this is in Phnom Penh in 2009, when I was representing uh, victims of the Khmer, Rouge, um, uh, the, the Khmer Rouge atrocities in the 70s, genocide. Um, what happened there, the, there was a similarity between the Nazis and the Khmer Rouge. Why? Because both of them, they were documenting everything. So all the other were documenting, all the list, all the structure, everything was documented, everything was on paper. But for the Khmer Rouge, which happened from 1975 to 1979, until early 1990s, there has been no effort to clean, to save the documentation. And it's an American law school, not this one, but another one, Yale Law School, which partnered with an, uh, an NGO in Phnom Penh, DC Camp, Documentation Center of Cambodia. And in the early 1990s, they cleaned up the confession, the every, all the material, the picture, all the chart, the command structure, they cleaned up, they saved it. And because they did that and they work with Khmer organization, NGOs in Phnom Penh, then we could have tribunals. And me, I was there. I was working for DC Camp, representing their victims. And this is how in my head it clicked. Again, it could have clicked just by reading what I told you about the Nazis hunt but I was not associated with it. So me, it clicked in 2009 in Plum Pen, and I thought, this is the way. Ha, we have the way to do it. It's by documenting, because this is how you get your evidence, and working with people who are people of the country where the crimes were committed. This is the way to do it. And of course, if you think about the Nazis, or if you think about the Khmer Rouge, you can win trials just by the documentation. I don't think for the guy of Queens that they sent back, they could prove he was an SS by calling guards who were with him. Because the guy was 98. So probably not many people are alive, but they probably had documentation. And the, the trial where I was involved, the S21 trial, the concentration camp in Phnom Penh, we had 
it was important to have victims and to have all of that, but we could have had no victims because we had documents. Okay? Now, in the war in Liberia, Sierra Leone, for example, where I was involved for the prosecution, you don't have orders. Many, many war, now it's different with cell phone and all of that, but in the 90s, many war were fought. You didn't have, and commander were young, and some of them were not educated, and you didn't have many orders. So how do you prove your cases? Well, it's by talking to witnesses. But witnesses die out of malaria sometimes early, so you need to preserve the evidence. This is how it clicked in my head in 2009 when I was in Plum Pen, and I thought we need to recreate a system, an organization, where you do a quest for justice with the same, I mean, uh, unfortunately we don't have uh, the means that the Jewish community uh, had or still has uh, to do the hunt of uh, a Nazi's alleged war criminal, but the idea was to try to recreate, even humbly, even in a little format, we create a quest for justice with that intensity, trying to do it in a systematic way. You go, you document, you work with people that you respect and you train if needed in the country where the crimes happen because this is their country and ultimately this is where justice one day needs to prevail. You do it with them and you start this quest for justice. <coughs> and when I started Civitas Maxima um, in um, 2012, Everybody I know told me not to do it, okay? And everybody, and people who care for me, huh, they told me not to do it. They thought it was crazy to do it. The reason why they thought it was crazy to do it is because one, there was no money for that. You do it outside the system. I told you the money goes with international court or if you work for a war crimes unit, but you do not get any funding available immediately if you just want to do a quest for justice with some victims somewhere and then build the evidence and then follow up the evidence and going anywhere to bring a case to a national, who is going to fund you? So this is outside the system. So you need to convince funder and to tell, to tell them, this is the way you can have an impact in the long run for justice. But it didn't, it, it was basically, you know, not usual to say the least. And of course, funder, and I understand them, funder, bless you, Funder very often are reluctant to give money to lawyers to be, to be legal cases. They prefer to give money for many other things, medical or schools or many other things. So first, people tell me, you will never find money. This is crazy. And then second, of course, Kate knows that everybody who knows in this field knows that these cases are very difficult to, 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 to put together and to win. Because again, remember, me, I wanted to work on Liberia. Because in Liberia, there has been two civil wars. There has been very, very vicious, vicious civil wars against um, the, um, the civilian population. Historians say 200 or 300,000 people killed. A president in January who was Nobel Prize, and yet no justice, none, none whatsoever. International community, Liberian government, they completely forgot about the Liberian victims. So me, I thought, this is the quest of justice that we are going to organize. And thank God, I was blessed and still blessed to know a hero in Liberia who was a former journalist, tortured by the then president Charles Taylor, who got asylum in Boston here in the United States, who has been prosecution witness, Hassan Bility, and I wanted to do it with him. And this is exactly what we did, and he created an organization now in Monrovia, Global Justice Research Project, which is uh, one of the most uh, reliable organizations that we build up with him from scratch. So this is what I want you to do. But these are complicated case to build. And what I'm, I'm going to tell my donor, so thank God I managed to convince some donor. Why do I sell at the end? The donor, they want to see what happened with their money, right? But these cases are very complicated to put together. Remember, you have you, are, you relied on some victims in very traumatic circumstances, very long time ago, who maybe so, maybe didn't see, maybe don't remember. These are complicated cases to win. And let me just give you one example to show you how, how complicated this is. I had another case on Sierra Leone, because we work as well on Sierra Leone and Ivory Coast, against an American citizen who was born in Belgium, dual citizen. The guy, is dead now, but the guy 
was trading blood diamonds during the Civil War. So he was going behind the rebel lines where the slaves were in the pits and he was giving money to rebels for them to buy weapons against, against, um, against diamonds, okay? And me, I was so upset that the Special Court Sierra Leone, for which I worked five years for prosecution, did not go after the white people who profited so much from the Civil War that I said, decided to build the case against that guy on my own. Okay, and then I put that case with Civitas Maxima, the organization that I created. It took me six years to finally get his arrest. He, on, he was on transit in Malaga, traveling back to the United States. Then we, we, we filed criminal complaint for pillage as a war crime in Belgium. Long story short, I had so many legal problems. It was such a complicated case. Finally, we were two months away from trial, 2016 in Brussels, two, three months away from trial. This would have been, in the legal history, the first ever case where a white business guy would have been convicted for pillage as a war crime for taking minerals from a conflict in Africa. It would have been so incredibly important. This is exactly what I was telling my donor. This is so incredibly important. You guess what? He killed, in, he killed himself what? six weeks before the trial. He was hiding pills in his mouth. And when he knew we had the case, he killed himself. What do I tell my donors? That's it, no case. In a finish. Seven years, done. So this is to show you that this is complicated. This is very complicated. And I understand why my friend told me not to do it. And then the last problem, <laughs> but then I have very good news. So there is a problem of funding. There is a problem that this is complicated and what do you show to your donor for? And the last problem is of course that my method, which we call bottom up, and which is working with your local trusted friends or colleagues in the country where the crime happened. And then you follow, like the Nazis did after World War II, you follow the evidence. You don't think, oh, I w I'm a Swiss, so I want to bring cases in Switzerland. No. You follow. You go from the ground, and then whatever, wherever the evidence leads you, understanding that in Liberia we cannot bring cases because our witnesses would be killed and the, the courts are corrupt, so we think we will not get justice. So we started to build cases against commanders in the diaspora, everywhere in the world. So we follow. So we don't know where we will end up, right? So this is complicated because me, I'm not a Belgium, I'm not a US, I'm not a Finnish, I'm not a, a UK lawyer, I'm just a Swiss lawyer. So I'm not allowed to practice in all these countries. So you need to build up to do that. You need to build up network of lawyers all over. And this is why what is more uh, easy for some NGOs, and I understand that they work in one country and they get cases in that country. But me, I'm not bound by any country. I'm following the track. I'm going anywhere this evidence can lead me. So to show you that this is off the beaten track, this is complicated. But here is the very good news. The very good news is that, and this is why now I can talk publicly about that, because obviously many of our cases were confidential. The very good news is that this is working. This experiment, this attempt to try to create something with some kind of intensity, bottom up, bottom up, with trusted local partner, as we did on Liberia, is working, okay? And this is just grounded on facts. And before we started to do that, there has been only one guy who had been convicted for war crimes in Liberia, and it was here in this country, in Miami, in 2008, and this was the son of Charles Saylor, Chucky, who got 97 or 98 years of prison for torture, but because he was American citizen because Charles Taylor had many, many sons and daughters, and one of them was a woman here in the 70s when he was in the US. So the kid, Chucky, was born and raised and grew up, he was an American kid, and he had a very bad idea, very bad idea, to when he was 17 or 18, to go back, I mean, not to go back, to go to Liberia, to be with his father, who went then was then um, head of state, and then, in a way, he became a monster and then they got him here. But because he was American citizen, and I'm not sure they would have prosecuted the case had he not be, been American citizen. So there was one case, 
Could you imagine? Two civil wars, all these people killed, nobody doing nothing, and just one case. Since we started with very little means, because you understood how complicated it is to convince donors, then we have been able, since 2012, starting first case, every year we get arrest. We have now, on Liberia, five arrests in five different countries, in the United States, in Switzerland, in Belgium, in France, in the United Kingdom, and many more. In investigation I cannot talk to about publicly, obviously, because they are ongoing, but in many other countries we are working with nine war crimes units all over the world. And this quest for justice, this Liberian quest for justice, recreating the intensity of the hunt for alleged war criminals on behalf of the victims, this Liberian quest for justice had a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful collateral effect, impact, that I did not, let me be very candid about that, I did not foresee it, okay? And it's not so much thanks to me, I think it's thanks to my team, um, which has been doing exceptionally well. But what has been happening is that the fact to get these extraterritorial cases, Liberian, all over the world, and then we create, and I will put you, for you to follow if you, if you want, we created a campaign on Facebook and on Twitter called the Liberian Quest for Justice to tell the Liberians that justice is coming and to tell the Liberians about hope is coming. Here is what we are trying to do for you all over the world. And we cannot get justice in Liberia, maybe one day, but here is what uh, we are doing. And then this Liberian Quest for Justice has absolutely fire up, fire up, Liberian organization, which were waiting for something like that to happen in order to be able to mobilize, to ask for justice in Monrovia. And now we are collaborating with cartoonists, with videos, with theater group. We are collaborating with a fantastic group in New York of journalists. And Joanna Devane here is in the room, working in Liberia with them, with someone who is fantastic, called Prue Clark, a journalist from Australia who created a group called New Narrative, working with Liberian journalists to train them, get them out of the corrupt system where politicians just pay them to write articles. So Pru has been working with the Liberian and Joanna many times has been in, uh, in Liberia as country director for Pru. And then with them, we send these Liberian journalists to follow the trial for the Liberian journalists themselves to see this justice going on, and then talk in the talk show, talk in Monrovia, in the newspaper. So it has had an immense impact in Liberia. And now the hope is that this quest for Liberian's quest for justice, obviously all these legal cases will still be ongoing, but the hope is that then we will manage to turn around impunity in Liberia with civil society, because this is their country at the end, obviously. So they know best. So they need to take responsibility exactly how they are doing now and turn impunity around in Liberia. So this system with very limited means, this system, I believe, is working. I'm almost on track yeah. with the time. <laughs> You're here. I still have two minutes? Yeah, almost. <laughs> so to conclude, I think there was two ways here. One way is to keep going, bless you. One way is to keep going, okay? And as I told you, there is a system in place, things are happening, not everything is to, to be thrown out of the window, bless you. Obviously not, and you know, if we, if we just keep going like that, then you know, there will always be some kind of justice for the victim somewhere, and maybe the stats will improve a bit, and at some point we will have, I don't know, 100, 500, 600, whatever, but it will not change the situation. <coughs> Bless you. It will not change the situation, and the situation is that we are failing, by and large, we are failing the victims of mass crimes when they should be the first one protected. We are failing them, and we just get some cases, and again, a lot of work behind every single case. So I'm not diminishing all the effort, 
but I'm just saying that as a system, then this does not work. And that's fine. I mean, many things do not work. So we could say, okay, but fine, it does not work. Or, or we now manage to scale up somehow, and then instead of have one Liberian quest for justice with that intensity, remembering the intensity you need in order to, to, to create and do this uh, quest for justice, then we start creating tens, 50, hundreds, 500, 1,000 quests for justice with groups organized, victims organized, with international lawyers who know what they're doing, outside politics, and then we follow the evidence. And this could, I think, create a systemic change. Because what would happen then is that these war crimes unit who are just, they're fine, they're taking the little case coming from NGOs, it's not much, and they, you know, and they, they justify their, their functioning, that's fine. But if suddenly you have all these quests for justice coming with credible cases, all these groups all over, there is a word I love in English, which is so complicated to pronounce for me, and this is exactly what we need here, and this is relent relentlessness. Right? And last night, <laughs> I went to look up what relentlessness means. <laughs> and relentlessness is such a complicated and beautiful word in English. And it means unwillingness to relent, unwillingness to let up. This is exactly what you need. You need quest for justice by groups all over the world focusing on one situation, following the trap, bottom up, flooding war crimes unit with good cases everywhere, and this, with this relentlessness, and I think this could get, in the years to come, this systemic change we are looking for. And if we manage, probably I won't be there anymore, but if we manage to do that, then that guy who killed 10,000 people, then that guy, I think, he will have, statistically, he will have a better, um, more chance to be held accountable than that. Thank you very much. Yes. And if you don't have questions, I can keep talking, no problem. <laughs> Sorry, students, come to the back. Thank you for your question. I mean, okay, maybe you, it's a very good question. Maybe I should have said that. I mean, obviously, I mean, these are complicated crimes because they are political crimes, okay? Most of the time, war crimes or crimes against humanity or genocide, they are committed by political actors. And this is exactly where the problem lies, okay? So this is the reason, and in a way, you can think that International criminal court should never have existed. It's, it's sort of, it's in me, I never believed it, could, be, it could, could happen. Think about that. The state would agree to get an independent prosecutor who could then indict for war crimes any sitting, no immunity, huh? any sitting head of state. This is not what you learn first year, I guess, here about international relations. This is not the way things go. So this was an extraordinary event, and in a way, the fact that politics is you know, somehow making sure that it takes care of its own interest is no surprise to anybody. So the short answer to your question is that these are, these, these are political crimes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so we talk about Africa and we talk about places where there is transparency of communication that people come to know about things. Now, I do know in places like China, for example, that there are two million people suffering right now, which are in very, very bad conditions. So how would you go after countries like China, for example? Right, okay, thank you for your question. So I should have said that as well. Um, I am not naive, okay? Um, and I should have said that, and thanks for your question. The, I think it's true to say that the Liberian quest of justice has worked 
so well, so quickly with so many results uh, in a way because Liberia is not a very big economic actor, okay? So when I go to wherever I go to meet prosecutors all over the world with my cases, I was never told, well, um, the foreign affairs or my ambassador there, uh, they interfere because they think that there could be economic, um, you know, trade problem, whatever. So it is absolutely true that if you start organizing quest for justice on China, on the US, on many, many countries which are big economic players, then you would have many more problems. This is a fact, okay? And for example, to give you an example, but there are many others in the United Kingdom now, and we have a case, the, another um, wife of Charles Taylor will be tried in, in Old Bailey, if any of you are in London in the coming month next year, will be very important. Uh, this is one of our cases, a torture case against a former um, wife of Charles Taylor who was a lecturer in a university in the UK and we got arrested by Scotland Yard. So they took my case, but when a Chinese or whatever, when someone with big interest is coming to London and an NGO group wants to file a complaint, what the UK does now is that they grant those people special immunity. Could you believe that? And, and groups have been challenging that in high court in London. We lost, I mean, we, on our side, it was, it, we lost, in, maybe it will go to the high court, but this is what is happening. Because they, of course they protect their interest, so if there is someone with whom they want to do trade and is coming with a bad human rights record in London to talk business, and the human rights community know about that and want to file a complaint, they give him a special immunity. This is unbelievable. So, I mean, I'm not naive. It's absolutely true that if you start organizing quest for justice on countries where there will be interest, it's going to be much more complicated. This is just real politics. But I do not think that this should prevent us. And the groups with whom we are talking would want to do anything, want to do things. But I think this is right to say that, you know, we had that success because I was never blocked because of economic interest. Yes, sir. Are you a student? Yes, I Okay, so yeah. you can ask me. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you very much. This is fascinating. Um, my question is, um, in, in a model like this one where we're focusing primarily on the national courts, um, what do you think that the proper role of the international courts should be? I'm listening to you um, because I was under instruction of my staff to put you if you want to follow. Can I, can I answer to you and write at the same time? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so the answer is that um, so the complementarity principle basically says that basically, as I told you, should be up to states to do the work, okay? And then what is in the Rome Statute is that is if states are unwilling or unable to take the cases, then the ICC should take the cases. And then there is jurisprudence, and obviously, because then the question is, what does unwilling mean? What does unable mean? But I think that Liber on, 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 on our cases, Liberia war ended in 2003. So almost all of the Liberia war would be outside the jurisdiction of the ICC starting 2002. But if it, even if it was not, if a, a country is interested in taking a case, well, depending on the case, but I would be, I don't know what, what Kate would think, but I would be surprised if the ICC say, oh, no, 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 we want to take that case. I think ICC would be quite happy for the national court to take up the case. Uh, we will have to see, but basically what complementarity means is that the countries should take the cases because, let's face it, they have the best capacities, and then um, if they are unwilling or unable, then the, uh, the ICC will step up. Yes. This is similar to that question, but you emphasize the need to go outside of politics and outside of the current system. Is it possible to reform the current system to make it more effective? Yes, so, so this is exactly what I think that, I mean, I do not have a solution outside the national court or the international court. Of course, there are human rights mechanisms. You, you can think of many things. But I want criminal justice for the victim I represent. I mean, it needs to be through, I mean, I cannot adjudicate myself, right? So at the end of the day, this is going to be through the courts. 
Okay? Now, I think what needs to change is the way that the victims are organizing themselves and, as I said, uh, mobilizing in order to build credible cases. Because what we hear, if you go to seminars or whatever conference from the war crimes unit, they will tell you many times it's just politics. So an advocacy group from anywhere will f file a complaint with basically very little fact just because they want, you know, they want, they want to say that this minister from that country is coming and he's a monster and they want to file a cheap complaint and get one day publicity. You know, of course this exists and this is a problem in our, on our, in our field is that, you know, we cannot prevent any lawyers filing any complaints on behalf of any victims just for political reasons with no facts. And what we, the problem is trying to get outside politics in this kind of field is complicated because the crimes are political in, by definition. So I think to be credible, if then you go that way or you go that way, but to be credible, you need to be at least seen as not political and then your, your facts, your case needs to be grounded in facts not just doing that because of, you know, because of you want to try to embarrass that government or that government. This is what is complicated. So for me, the way is professionalization of, on the NGO side, of the community uh, victims group, and then um, doing that professionally. And it's complicated because sometimes you tell victims that you need to wait a long time for the evidence to be collected well before you go. You know, it takes time, it's complicated, and they want to go, and they want the publicity. So. All of that is complicated, but I think that the way by, by, by putting intensity in that quest and, and doing it more and more, I think this is the way to go. I mean, frankly, I mean, this is what I'm very happy to debate with you. If you have another way, I would be very happy to, uh, because I'm really obsessed about these things. So if you have another way, then I would be very happy to, uh, to know about it. Yes, sir. This is a very, very good question. Thank you very much for, for, for asking it. You see, Habre is very interesting because so the, the, the idea was to try to get Habre somehow, somewhere, okay? So we, uh, we the, the victims filed complaint in, in, in Senegal and then at the time, uh, you seem to know both, so at the time there was a president, um, President Wad, who was not amenable because Habre was married with his daughter or whatever, and he had allegedly corrupt the marabou, so the religious dignitaries in Dakar. So anyway, it was blocked politically. And then when the current president uh, won the election, um, Makefal, then the situation changed. To answer your question, at some point, I think on our side, we didn't care so much if at the end he was going to be tried in the Senegalese regular court or if the African Union, because what happened, I forgot to say that, is the African Union at some point really did so well to embarrass the government and the Belgium wanted a case. And of course, it was impossible for an African government to send an, an, a, for, an, I mean, a former colleague, um, former president to Belgium. Could you imagine with the, with the story of Leopold and the colonization of Congo, you would have sent Habre to be tried in Europe, it, it was input. never they would have done that. So they were looking for something. And the African Union came and said, okay, we give mandate from the African Union and we created this African, how is it called, African Extraordinary Chamber? Fine, within the, the, co the, the um, within, the, we, so all of us, we had to see the batony of Dakar to be admitted within, you know, the batony of Dakar in order to plead. They're fine, we would have done anything. So answer to your question is, if that is the way at some point, it at some point on one situation, the way is an hybrid somewhere. Take Liberia. I mean, Liberian courts will not have the means, and I don't think Liberia, I don't know if anyone is from Liberia here, but, oh yeah, so, so you, should, you should talk about that. I don't think Liberia would be very happy when the country is really struggling economically to pay for the court. I think if there is a court in Liberia, Possibly we will be looking 
for a donor elsewhere, then if that way for donors they want to set up an extraordinary Liberian chamber within the court of Liberia, backed by the African Union, fantastic, I would say. You know, I mean, this is, I think it's a very good question, and I think that on, uh, this is what Reid really uh, taught me, is that anyway, anyway, I mean, you go anyway, you're flexible, and then you just find a way. So yes, absolutely, it can absolutely be an hybrid. Of course, now we can talk about the ECCC and all the complexity of the ECCC, where, you know, the government is so complicated in Plan Pen, and now we, we are wondering what, you know, if it's, they are using the ECCC more than the other way, but yes. Okay, I will try to finish. So Facebook up, and then I really want to give you this beautiful Liberian quest for justice. So share that as much as you can, anywhere you can. And then I just give you the Twitter, and we are done. Yes, Bunny. So are there any cases you're working on, like here in Sierra Leone, with addressing the issue of the weapon of war? Are any of your victims women who are victims of violence? Thanks for this question. Very important question. Yes, answer is yes. Absolutely. And then what we are discovering, and frankly, I thought I knew the Liberian civil war quite well because I worked uh, on Charles Taylor case and then I'm now working for eight years on the, on the um, just, I mean, documenting the Liberian conflict. And we are discovering pattern in our cases, houses where women were put in those houses, different faction, and then held there, and the commander were going and doing whatever, raping very young girls in those houses. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. We have, we have sexual violence in almost all our cases. And to tell you, and w frankly, me, me, I'm quite optimistic as a guy, and I'm not so many times depressed, but I was so depressed. When Michel de Sandelier, this, this Belgium guy I told you, Belgium-American guy I told you about, when the Belgium, so me, I knew he had been taking diamonds uh, in, in Sierra Leone, in Kono district, uh, and he was working with Charles Taylor from Liberia, and I had been told once by one insider that these white guys, they were using young slaves. When they were going behind the rebel lines, they were sleeping with young women. But he was an insider, and me, I thought I needed to be credible when I filed a criminal complaint in Belgium, and I want to, to keep the fact that I knew where, you know, where I had corroborated evidence and all of that. I did not include that, but you know, guess what? When the Belgium, went to investigate themselves in Sierra Leone when the San Julia was still alive. Our partner convinced the government to let the Sierra Leoneans, or the Belgium going there. They met some women and there were stories about sexual violence by white men. So it was not only the, the commanders of the rebel movement. I believe, I believe that some white corporate actor not only going there to get the minerals and everything, but on top of that, they were using uh, the slaves of uh, the rebel movement. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we have like two minutes, so if there's a short, fast question. Yes, madam. No, I mean, what I know is that the U.S. will never join the ICC, even under President Obama. So, of course not, but they are trying to destroy it just like fast. So, and sorry, they will never join the ICC. And let's be frank about the ICC. And again, I mean, you can always look at the glass and say it's half full, half empty. I mean, truth is, I don't know how many countries, 120, whatever, are joining, have joined the ICC. China is not in in terms of number of, uh, of inhabitants. Pakistan is not in, India is not in, United States is not in. I mean, I th in, in terms of, of number of people, not most, but I don't, didn't do the math. Could have done last night, but I didn't do that math. <laughs> but most, 
most of the people you know, are, are citizens of countries which are not in the SEC. So I do not think, to answer your question, that the, the United States anytime soon will join the ICC. And I didn't have enough time and everything, but we are working with the United States on the Liberian cases in an in interesting way, which was not without, without concerns on our sides, but I think, frankly, um, the district attorneys in Philadelphia have been doing fantastic. We are working with building, we built two already um, cases on Liberian who lied to immigration. And when you lie to immigration, if you want to have a citizenship here, you have to answer questions such as, have you, have you committed war crimes? And if you, if you tick no, but then we can prove that you have committed war crimes, then you are in very big trouble. And then what is interesting in that case is there are immigration cases, but what is interesting is that, that in order to prove that you have lied, then I have to prove that you committed the war crimes. And then we can bring, uh, the US could bring uh, uh, victims from Liberia to prove that. So in a way, it's an immigration case, but in court, you know, you have victims facing the guy they say committed crimes against him or her. So, and again, this is, you know, participating to that logic. We were a bit worried because what we didn't want in the US to send back, to kick out like this, this 98 years old guy, we didn't want, there was one instance as George Bully where he was sent back to Liberia after an administrative case, and this is not what you want because, you know, we don't want the guy to be, now he's a senator in Liberia, he was elected. So could you imagine? You know, he's, 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 he's held in, a, in an administrative court. He says he's guilty, he's sent back, and now he's a senator in impunity in Liberia. So we didn't want to participate to that. But a criminal case for perjury, for someone to have lied, and the, one of the commander, Yuli Jungle Jabba, he got 30 years because he lied. So it's pretty serious. And, we, and the US attorneys did exceptionally well, managed to, by bringing Liberian victims, managed to show that indeed he had lied because indeed he had committed including very, gru very gruesome sexual violence. Very gruesome. Okay. We're out of time. All right, thank you very much for your, for your time.